Hi, I'm William Raska, the editor for Video Abstracts in Pediatrics. How do you like to get your information? Do you have difficulty keeping up with all the medical information? I know I do. These are several unopened journals that have accumulated on my desk. Recognizing that everyone is busy and that everyone has different learning preferences, we in the journal Pediatrics decided to publish video abstracts starting in April 2018. And since that time, we've published more than 50 video abstracts. The authors have been really creative. In a space of two to five minutes, they've really captured the essence of their study. They've been marvelous. Shall we take a look at a few examples? Join me. Dr. Kemp. I have the latest version of the manuscript. Thank you. This manuscript reports on U.S. pediatricians and family physicians' response to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices' recent recommendations for the use of serogroup B meningococcal vaccine, or MenB vaccine. Let's take a look at our findings. After outbreaks of serogroup B meningococcal disease on college campuses beginning in 2009, two men B vaccines were licensed under an accelerated FDA approval process. In October of 2015, ACIP recommended that 16 to 23 year olds may be vaccinated with men B vaccine based on individual clinical decision making with a preferred age of 16 to 18 years. This type of recommendation is called a Category B recommendation because it is not routine for all persons in a group, but is made based on individual clinical decision making. A routine recommendation is called a Category A recommendation. After an expert panel review, almost 4% of children were excluded as their allergic symptoms were inconsistent with an IgE-mediated food allergy. Many children may be unnecessarily avoiding a food, again underscoring the importance of proper physician diagnosis and management. The top nine food allergies reported in children include peanut, milk, shellfish, tree nut, egg, finfish, wheat, soy, and sesame. 0.2% of children in the U.S. are reported to have a sesame allergy, making it the ninth top allergen. Currently, it is not part of the Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act to list sesame clearly on labels in the U.S. like the other eight most common allergens. Among children with food allergy, 40% reported food allergies to multiple foods, and 42% reported having a severe allergic reaction to their food allergen. The functional severity of cerebral palsy is classified in five levels, as shown here, ranging from walking without limitation, level one, to being severely limited in self-mobility and postural control, level five. Individuals in level four or five are unable to walk independently. It is known that children with cerebral palsy develop their motor capacity slower than typically developing children when growing up. Capacity means whether someone can do something, such as climbing four steps in a standardized environment. So far, it is unknown how a child develops what she does do, such as actually using the stairs in a daily context, which is performance. Therefore, we studied the, the development of performance of motor skills and daily activities of children in use with cerebral palsy into their late 20s. 
I'm Kelly Kelleher, a pediatrician at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. At most hospitals, this is a patient. But at Nationwide Children's Hospital, this is one of our most important patients, our neighborhood. Neighborhood effect syndrome, characterized by symptoms of poverty, including blight, housing insecurity, racial segregation, trauma, violence in poorly performing schools, and environmental toxins, has debilitating consequences on child health. Healthcare providers frequently encounter challenges to caring for children from affected neighborhoods. These children often experience poorer outcomes compared to their peers in unaffected neighborhoods. Historically, institutions have been largely ineffective in changing these outcomes with one child at a time tactics. We're here today to discuss an article entitled, Social Aspects of Hookah Smoking Among U.S. Youth. I'm joined by the senior author of the paper, Dr. Israel Agaku, and co-author, Dr. Rebecca Glover Cudon. Let's start with Dr. Glover Cudon. Would you explain why this study was done? Sure. Hookah or water pipe smoking is a social experience that's increased in popularity in the United States. Unlike other tobacco products, hookah pipes are designed for multiple users. Because hookah tobacco is sold in flavors like candy and chocolate and marketed as a way to bring close friends together, it appeals to young people. Also, because hookah smoke passes through a water column, there's a potential misperception that they're less harmful. However, one hour-long hookah smoking session is equivalent to smoking about 100 cigarettes. So given the increasing popularity of hookah smoking in the U.S. and the risk of nicotine to the developing adolescent brain, we wanted to know more about hookah smoking patterns among youth. In this paper, we'll highlight how as providers, our unique experience surrounding certain diagnoses may set us up for implicit bias when we share these diagnoses as objectively bad news. You'll hear the story of Carissa and Chris Carroll and the birth of their son, Jack. They'll tell the story of how they were given the unexpected news that their son had Down syndrome, and how they later learned that multiple families shared similar experiences in the way that they were given this news. Quite often, these stories began with the phrase, I'm sorry, I have some bad news. Yet the Carols would come to realize, like data show the majority of families do in situations such as these, that their son's diagnosis was not bad at all. It was simply unexpected. In this paper, we partner with the Carroll family to present an alternative paradigm to breaking bad news, especially when that news may reflect our own implicit bias as providers that it is in fact objectively bad. 